Uh, welcome back to the Shot by Shot podcast. I'm joined by my co-hosts, Oscar, Ryan, and Will. Today, we're going to be talking about a film that is one of the best films ever from one of the best film decades ever, from one of the best filmmakers ever, and that is Paul Thomas Anderson's masterpiece, the best Paul Thomas Anderson film, Boogie Nights. Paul Thomas Anderson directed Boogie Nights at the young age of 26, which he does a fantastic job of making me feel like absolute shit about myself and where I am with my own life, as he should. And yeah, so he pulled off at 26 years old. It was only his second film he had ever made and just made a true timeless classic. It's so influential in so many ways. And there's just so many layers of brilliant storytelling throughout it. One of the truly greatest ensembles of characters we've ever possibly seen on film. And he balances them so seamlessly at a film that doesn't even hit a full three-hour runtime. So, Will, do you have anything you'd like to let everyone know before we get into spoilers, just as for why this is a film they absolutely should watch if they haven't seen it yet? Yeah, for sure. Um, Boogie Nights is like one of my favorite movies. It's one of the first movies that kind of opened my mind to what filmmaking can be and how influential a director can be when filmmaking. Um, and I haven't revisited since. So just leading up to this, I watched it bits and pieces here, here and there, and I got a feel for how great it, it truly is. Um, and yeah, I just want to piggyback on what you're saying about PTA as, as a director and writer, you know, like he wrote this through high school and then obviously released this when he was 26, 27 years old. So the standard in which he's, he's able to set here at a really young place in his career is pretty remarkable. Um, but that shouldn't, you know, deter anyone else because, you know, long car careers are long, you know, James Cameron, Scorsese, those guys didn't get their breaks till later, I guess. Um, but yeah, that's, uh, my intro to Boogie Nights. I, uh, love it and I'm super excited to talk about it. Um, Oscar, I don't know how you were introduced to Boogie Nights or if you have any personal connection with it. Um, not like personally, I only watched it for the first time, like uh, January, I think it was. I think I'd already seen like two PTA by then, but watched it again. Obviously, last week just shot up straight away. I had it at like a high uh, four point five last time. It just shot up straight into my top twenty already. He's one of my favorite directors of all time. I think his ability just spans so many different genres and so many different time periods is just so so impressive. Mm -hmm. And you can make a lot of comparisons with this film to films like Pulp Fiction as well, like Goodfellas has been mentioned as well. But I think for me, this is the the best of those films. And it's just so incredibly entertaining, which is what makes it most impressive for me. Mm -hmm. um, uh, Ryan, do you know if you had anything to add? Yeah, I totally agree. Yeah. This is one of the best films of the 90s. Um, it's a great passageway into PTA's filmography. I think it was only second film, which is crazy. Obviously, Dunny's first film, Hard Eight, which was like completely just over controlled by the the studio. He didn't have much control over like the end of a thing, and he was just, they released the cut that wasn't his. So he, he really went into this making just a very fun movie. Like that's why it's it's pretty long, but it is such a fun movie from the nineties. Um, he really put everything that he had from his inspirations from his childhood and, ever, and everything. So I really think it was such a a, a great film. And yeah, like Oscar, it is. I think it's. Probably my top 70 films of all time. Um, a high four and a half, I think. But yeah. I also have it at a four and a half. I think it's 55 in my all-time list. Four and a half, 55. Am I, am, am I the only one? Oh, no, Ryan, you said four and a half as well. Yeah, right? same. Yeah, you, I assume both of you have it at five, Alex and Oscar. Both. I don't yeah. know if anyone doesn't have this movie at a five. And I think <laughs> a nice example of just why both of you clearly have not seen this movie in a movie theater because... Personally, like, it's almost the movie's been spoiled for me. I, I got the chance to see this on 35 millimeter film. It had three shows and I went to all three shows. It was one of the best movie theater experiences I ever had in my life. The drug deal scene, which we'll get more in depth of later, is just so insanely captivating with the theater speakers. But we'll get into all that later. It, it's truly just some of the most brilliant storytelling from Paul Thomas Anderson. And, you know, some people wonder why... You know, some people artists at the film wonder why we hold Paul Thomas Anderson so highly as a storyteller compared to some people who make more of the mainstream mainstream films. And, you know, like what sets him apart from the rest of the pack? And I think what we really see here is PTA was a young kid who hadn't really got to showcase what he could do yet. And he just is the versatility in the different ways he tells his stories is just unmatched. 
every single scene, he's telling the story in a fresh way. Often when you'll see a Hollywood film, if you really pay attention to the images, what they'll do is they'll show you a really wide shot in the landscape. Then as the conversation starts, they'll cut in. You'll have characters from around the waist up going back and forth over the shoulder. Move into close-ups as the scene intensifies. And that's like pretty much the standard format. It's almost like if you are coaching an NFL team and you have a star running back and just you just run it up the middle with that guy every play. Very efficient. Paul Thomas Anderson is the type of guy who he wants to, you know, get really creative with his playbook. And every scene, he just tells the story in such a fresh way with sometimes a static, you know, constantly moving camera, sometimes on a dolly, sometimes handheld, sometimes just these long, strong, static compositions. And he's just always playing around with the way stories can be told with this medium. And I think he literally tries every technique in the book. You just see he's such a student of the craft and loves to, and just wants to experiment with the craft himself and showcase what a craftsman he is. And even just things like he really shows you the artifice of film in a way that most other people don't. Like people will think of someone like a Jean-Luc Godard where they do things like freeze frames that call your attention to the film. But Paul Thomas Anderson doesn't do it as directly. It's more with just the subject matter of the film and seeing Jack in the editing room and seeing how the film is made so you really, even though these are a very different type of filmmaking from Hollywood films being pornography films instead, you see there's still a, a similarities in the filmmaking process of it, which he's kind of exposing and making the audience aware of, which I think frees up a lot of creativity in terms of the audience having to worry about the audience maybe noticing that they're watching a movie rather than trying to make it seem like a more seamless experience. But yeah, Oscar, what do you think are... Yeah, just about Paul Thomas Anderson's storytelling in the whole film. Yeah, I think it's uh, there's kind of um, a clear divide between kind of two points in this film. Um, obviously, between the 70s and the 80s in this, I think that's what kind of makes it stand out so well is because both sides of the timeline is just absolute chaos. But one's kind of slightly, the first half is more like kind of organized chaos. And like the 80s side is definitely more uncontrolled chaos. And I think kind of they're really there's a drastic kind of shift between those two. But somehow he makes that shift in tone work so perfectly and seems so natural. I think that's just so impressive from a, from a storytelling perspective, because I know a lot of people who really kind of don't like that that shift to the 80s. People think it, there's a really big drop off, but I completely disagree is is just absolutely fantastic to see. And. That's why he's one of my favorite directors. Will, you got anything to add? Yeah, totally. I just want to kind of touch back on what Alex was saying there. Like, this story kind of feels like a kid wrote it. Like, it's very off the wall. The characters are very surreal. They almost don't feel like real people. But when you peel back the layers and start to look at it from a greater perspective, you realize that these are real people and they do have, you know, real aspirations and goals. Um, and I just feel like that film, that type of filmmaking is so prevalent in this film. Like, it's, it's got this expertise and perfection, professionalism about the way it's shot. It kind of, like Alex said, it's like you got Tyree Kill, Jalen Waddle, you're M Mike McDaniel. You might as well open up the playbook, do something crazy, pull out all the stops to give you the best offense or make the best film. Um, and that's definitely what it does. Like he respects the convention, um, but he adds to that immensely with this kind of uh, exuberant and energetic childlike perspective to his filmmaking. And I really feel that in this one for sure. Um, like Oscar said as well, it also has a lot of influence from some of the greatest films ever, the greatest filmmakers ever in the way of Goodfellas and Pulp Fiction. Like these are two staple films that are um, very, very prevalent in uh, Boogie Nights, you could say. And the influence is definitely there um, with Scorsese and uh, Tarantino. But yeah, just his filmmaking at, at this point in his career is, is so exceptional and it can't be understated how unique and uh, ahead of its time, it was. It, it truly is amazing and definitely um, is one of my favorite directors, Paul Thomas Anderson is. Ryan? Yeah, exactly. Like what you said, there is a, like a clear inspiration from directors like Scorsese and even Tarantino, even though he was really early on in his career as well in the 90s. But yeah, there was this thing that, I mean, PT was a bit insecure about um, all these directors pulling from, they like to pull from their childhoods um and all these things that inspire them, but he was just a boy from the valley. He didn't really have much, so he, he had to go back and um, really own what his childhood was like, and he had this really weird obsession with pornos from the 70s. That man has seen way too many of them. It was very weird, him just going through all his favourite pornos. 
Um, but yeah, he didn't only want, only want to make a film about this industry, obviously. He knew that that alone would not be interesting enough for like both the audience and himself just making a film. Uh, his film needed to be more than that. And he, he definitely achieves that with Boogie Nights. Um, there's a lot more than you would initially assume. Like at the time, people were really excited for the film. Um, during to like due to the enticing pull of like party and drugs, sex, um, but really uh, underneath is a story about unconventional people and and broken people really, and the, the, how they're able to build their own family. Like we see Eddie, Mark Wahlberg, as an abusive mother and father that doesn't really seem to care. Um, so he leaves, he walks out of home and walks into another home with Bart Reynolds. Um, he's kind of his surrogate father, and Julian Moore is the mother. Um, we see Roller Girl as well. We don't really see her start, but she is kind of been lost in her life doesn't know what to do in school um and she's kind of recruited by jack as well and i mean the scene that really shows us so well is the diner scene they're sat at both ends um we have there's a lot of main characters in beginning nights but this is really our core four setting like a sort of nuclear family in our story um kind of represents jack amber sitting on one side of the table the mum and the dad and then opposite there's jack or not jack um dark and roller girl and dark is really missing that father figure in his life um, so he's sitting on one side with Amber Waves and Jack, the other side of the table, sitting with Amber, the girl that doesn't have that father figure in her life. And it just really sets up all of our close characters really well, really early on in the story. Yeah, so Alex, what did you have to say about um, this storytelling? Yeah, I think it's really interesting the way Paul Thomas Anderson just embraces where he's from in San Fernando Valley, where, yeah, obviously he mentions how he was kind of insecure about that because... You hear these directors who come from all these unique places and really just eventful, like movie story like lives behind the artist. And he felt like, you know, he had kind of the same story as everyone else being a kid from California, where obviously we know the industry flooded with people from that market. And just the way he was able to take his kind of California voice and just embrace it in a way that had never really been done before. And he's I think most great filmmakers tend to make films about flawed characters and he kind of really found this flawed, like high excitement type of world within almost like an underworld of the San Fernando Valley. You know, I think one thing he does just so well is he creates these incredibly immersive environments. It's never like the world just shuts down around the characters for them to speak. There's always so much going on. And it's as if we just literally drop the camera on any party and just kind of float throughout it and like get little character moments. But the characters are always very in the middle of doing something it's not like they're just waiting for their cue and just it's that one moment to elevate the story it just feels very documentary like in that way but really it's just the way he balances these characters is so insanely incredible like in terms of major film characters who actually play like a significant role like we have Dirk, amber jack reed buck scotty roller girl louise jerome becky tom and bill like that's 12 characters who are like have decently significant and memorable roles in the film and it never feels like they all feel like very fleshed out and like fully multi-dimensional characters. They don't feel like they're there just for that one beat in the story to guide the main character along his journey. They're, you know, real, very fleshed out characters. And his character writing really just separates him from pretty much all other directors. And yeah, I think there is, you know, Paul Thomas Anderson's versatility as a filmmaker when you look at his filmography for this compared to like a Phantom Thread. He's developed and changed so much as an artist, but one thing that has always been at that core is this kind of surrogate family and elements of family throughout his work, which I think uh, is definitely one of his core defining traits when you watch him develop his style. So, Will, I know you had some thoughts on the characters you, want to get in, you wanted to get into, so what do you think about just how he creates this ensemble and his character arts? Yeah, for sure. I think you bring up some really good points. Uh, firstly, I want to touch on, like, PTA, how, how diverse his themes are across all of his films. But one um, constant is family. And that was something I never even occurred to me like this kind of lingering for a surrogate family. But another constant theme, I think, is kind of like this singular male character, like this monolithic, yet maybe morally corrupt central figure. And uh, that's kind of throughout his entire filmography. And I think in Boogie Nights, you get that character, but then you get, like Alex said, 11 other um, characters who have a different perspective, different archetype. They're going through different series of events, but they're all still intertwined so beautifully. They can play off each other in a way that doesn't feel crammed or forced. They all have their own stuff going on. So they each, each provide like a fulfilling 
um, second character. So they all feel like a main character, you could say. Um, and that's just down to PTA's writing and his ability to flesh out characters and write dynamic conversations and generate meaning behind them. Um, and I think that is really important between Jack and Dirk. And I think that is like the best relationship in the entire movie because Jack is really like this parental figure to Dirk um, when he kind of leaves home, you could say. And then he goes down this arc of naive little kid to like egotistical superstar. And that transition is embodied by the first scene when he meets Jack. He kind of meets him in the bar. He's working as like a dishwasher and Jack kind of calls him over and uh, Mark Wahlberg's kind of like, I don't know, I don't know. And then there's a conversation between the two of them later on where um, uh, where Dirk is trying to shoot. Like he wants to shoot a video and Jack's like, wait, hold on, like, wait, wait, wait. And uh, Mark Wahlberg's like, now, I got to shoot now, I got to shoot now. And it's almost like the roles have been reversed. Like one is demanding. Um, so it's just really cool to see that transition. And it happens pretty um, seamlessly throughout. So it's not a huge huge transition arc but Dirk Diggler is one of my favorite characters in cinema and PTA did a really fantastic job fleshing out this character and writing it you know all through his uh, throughout high school because I know he was working on this character all throughout high school and then it was a short film adapted into a, a full-length feature but yeah absolutely brilliant characters the way they play off one another the acting again phenomenal um but Ryan I know you want to talk about some of the characters and and how they performed yeah, definitely. There's so many good characters in this, and he does such a good job of setting them up early on. Like one of the best things about Boogie Nights is just the many continuous long takes that we have throughout the film. And he starts with one of these. It's the it starts of the nightclub. Um, starts the the kind of name of the nightclub. It acts as a really cool alternative title title card for the movie, which is just so cool. And then this long take is just a masterclass for establishing all the characters that we have in the movie. We enter the club, going from actor to actor setting the tone and atmosphere of the 70s and the film it's just a basic intro for all the characters setting them up and the relationships that they share throughout the whole movie um and the main interaction we see here is when eddie makes eye contact with jack like you said i was kind of setting up our main plot point of a young boy with lots of ambition looking to break in and then the older experienced man looking for a chance to find the kind of next big discovery in the business yeah it's so it's so well known that the, the inspiration that pt has from scorsese um and he really, really plays into the the story that he's used throughout many of his films here, and um, particularly the structure of Goodfellas, which is really um, clear from the start, like a young character looking to be taken to an experienced group. Like we see a lot of similar similarities, um, of course, with um, um, Ray Liotta's character is kind of struggling at home as well. He's kind of attracted to the life of the gangsters and the glamorous lifestyle, and at that time he only sees them living that great lifestyle. He doesn't see the bad side of it, and just like Boogie Nights, Eddie only sees the fun and game side of the business in it. At this point, he's just similarly kind of groomed into joining Jack, and yeah, and we will also see a lot of the inspiration towards the end of the film as well. Like the the very end is exactly like Raging Bull, like the last ten minutes. It, it, it's a clear inspiration from Scorsese for it. But yeah, Oscar, do you have anything to add about the characters? Uh, yeah, kind of going along the characters. I think it's really clever how kind of most people kind of like around this time and even more now think like porn stars are kind of these perfect characters or they have like the perfect body uh, they're, all, they're all kind of perfect way and things like that but i think this film kind of brings that down to reality you know you've got such a mix of characters across um race sex weight even you've got kind of uh philip seymour hoffman's characters um like we've mentioned uh before ryan mentioned kind of the characters that are just wanting that lifestyle that like clinging onto that dream and the there's several moments with his character that he's just trying so hard to, to get closer to that role and i think like even his character like the outfits he wears i think that the outfits are perfect for conveying uh what type of character you see in this film you got all those vests and everything and kind of stomachs hanging out people and people uh the characters are slightly overweight even john c riley riley's character like i don't think people would consider him maybe the most attractive person there but uh, he's he's in the film and he suits the role perfectly but I think it's just a really clever way of like conveying like character lifestyle as a whole and how people are um are just so obsessed and amazed with the idea of uh sex and everything. And I think uh uh PTA uses kind of uh the use of staring really, really well in this film. You got you, there's just so many scenes of uh cuts to faces where people are just frozen still, no blinking, nothing. And I think that's uh really, really big for the characters. Yeah, back to you, Alex. 
Yeah, I think, uh, well, I got to disagree with you, though. I actually think the best relationship of the film, so I, uh, Jack Horner is my favorite character of the film. Like, I, Burt Reynolds is a classic. I think he's such a great character. Those two are so good, man. Mark and yeah. Burt Reynolds together, it's like that relationship. Okay, I'm curious to see who's your favorite relationship. But I, I just think the strongest relationship of the film is, okay. uh, is Dirk and Amber. And the reason I say that is because it's done in such a cinematic way. I think the relationship between Dirk and... Jack is very it's very addressed in the dialogue constantly where I think the relationship with Amber uh, Paul Thomas Anderson does such a great job building beneath the surface and using heightened camera moves and certain cinematic techniques to really let us know what the feelings between those that relationship rather than addressing it through talking um, and we know that obviously from the first scene when Amber gets back to Jack's house before they even meet before she meets her that, you know, she has once had a relationship with her son, but because of custody battles, she can't. And it's very like, throwaway quick, but in the scene where uh, it's Dirk's first day on set, Amber says that she's fixed. So there we know that uh, she can't have another kid. So because she kind of has this maternal lacking of, or maternal desire for like a, son, a surrogate son, I think that's where Dirk comes into play. In terms of the giving, fulfilling what Amber wants in her life, which is essentially she wants a son. And just from the very first scene they meet at the diner, it's originally more standard in terms of filmmaking. It's a shot, reverse shot conversation between Jack and Durr. And we build that relationship. But the relationship with Amber is built when all of a sudden the camera just starts moving away. And the audience really notices this camera move. And it's like, wait, why are we moving away from the person who's talking? That's not something they normally do. And then he does it again with Dirk. I forget if he does it with Dirk first or with Amber first, but it creates cinematically that connection between them without any words, which I think is brilliant. And then it, he takes it a step further with, uh, I think, one of the best moments of the film where it's super subtle, but there's that other guy, I forget his name, who is kind of taking Dirk's spot in the second half of the film. He's like the new porn star. He's like the new Dirk. And... We see him doing a bunch of cocaine. It's actually right before the scene that Will was talking about. I mean, yeah, right before then. And we see Dirk looking, and we see him looking at him talking to Jack. And we think, oh, he's jealous that he's talking to Jack and kind of taking on that relationship. But then the camera just slides, and we realize that Jack was blocking our view of Amber. And Amber's actually the one he was talking to. So... What originally made us think he was jealous of the relationship with Jack, it was actually Amber, and it's just done with that just slide movement of just drawing your attention there with the camera. And I just think that, honestly, Julianne Moore, I think, is the best performance in the film. She's one of the best actresses of all time. Definitely one of the best working today. And, yeah, I mean, Paul, just the way she takes on that motherly role and just feels so conflicted, but also like a flawed character at the same time, they're all flawed characters, which makes them so interesting. But even though they have their flaws, there's just such a communal element between them, which is part of why you like these role you care about these characters so much and the relationships. Just capped off with that final walkthrough of Burt Reynolds walking through the house with the tracking shot. Feels like a father coming home from his work. You know, you got like the friend or the the uncle making food, and then he goes, sees the kids, like roller girl goes by, and then all he goes back to essentially his surrogate wife, which is Amber. And it's just so visually, does such a great job visually of capturing these more family-like relationships. But uh, Ryan, I'll pass it off to you. Yeah, I definitely agree with you. I think that Amber and um, Dark was definitely the more interesting relationship of the movie. Like going back to the diner scene, like you said, um, it does a lot with the camera to kind of show that from the start. Like it cuts from both of them. Um, they're kind of to the right of this the the still of the the frame and there's a big empty space to the both their left and right it's kind of symbolizing their kind of missing the mother and um son figure in their lives so i think he does a really good job um stylistically of showing that right from the start and yeah and the the family dynamic is really good for the whole film like you said at the, the end where he's walking for the house and um, he talks to the roller girl he's kind of talking to her like a um a daughter telling her to go and clear her room um so it really emphasizes that like father daughter relationship again but yeah, um, Oscar Rowe, do you have anything to add about that? Yeah, okay. I think you guys are right. Like the mother-son relationship definitely holds priority. And PTA definitely visually tells that really well. But I just think the dialogue and the connection between like the time 
um, Mark or Dirk Diggler, Mark Wahlberg, and Burt Reynolds, Jack, spend on screen together. I feel feel like those are the best scenes in the movie. So for me, like that relationship, just based on how well they can act off one another, how well their characters interact, how well it kind of all comes together with the mother, father, and son. I think it just kind of adds to it. But I definitely see what you guys are saying with the Julianne Moore as the mother. It's definitely laid out. And she's so protective. And like at the very end, uh, about this, the scene that Alex and I are talking about, which is what I think one of the best scenes in the entire film. Um, Julianne Moore like, freaks out. She's like, oh, no, no. Like, like treating him like a child, like a like a son in that sense. Um, but yeah, great, great performances from Julianne Moore and Burt Reynolds. Um, Oscar, did you have uh, anything to mention about them? Uh, yeah, kind of piggybacking off like family relationships. But for me, maybe not the best relationship, but the one that have, gets the most antenna out of me is the, the Dirk and uh, Reed uh, relationship. Because talking about like father and mother, this is a clear kind of wannabe brother relationship. And I just think it those two just work so, so well throughout the film. You got kind of all the running kung fu jokes and all the kind of uh, intro commercials that they made, which are really iconic, but absolutely hilarious. And then... um that transition uh, into the 80s and they just out of nowhere start recording music together and he's just um reads just there in the background just trying to think everything along and it, um the producer guys um uh what is wanting to change the music and he's reads just having none of it at all but i think uh, that relationship works really really well and that just goes to show how uh how effective he is at, as a writer kind of just balancing those relationships that aren't actually mother and father relationships or brother or sister relationships there nothing at all but he just conveys that in such a perfect perfect way yeah and i th- I think it's so interesting how even in you know a, a world like this where it's very sex drugs rock and roll paul thomas anderson is still able to find you know a family core in his story but another really interesting uh, thing paul thomas anderson i've heard comment on is he, he claims that he thinks if uh, video had never came in and then pornography and pornographic films would eventually become a legitimized art form where people actually more of like a, a respected in the art community. And when you look at the highest grossing films of the 1970s, you know, today you look at that list and it's all Marvel movie, Avengers, like uh, whatever, whatever franchise, Mario Brothers, whatever IP franchise. But when you look in the 70s, there were actual pornographic movies on the highest top 10 highest grossing films list, which is kind of interesting to see because I would have never guessed that at least. And what we really see here as the core conflict is characters who are struggling to adapt to changing times. And I think Paul Thomas Anderson, that element of it is very personal to him because we know along with Quentin Tarrant, you know, he's been a huge advocate for shooting on film and preserving the craft of shooting on film uh, in response to the boom of digital filmmaking. And I think we really see him comment on that here. And I think he's sort of speaking through Jack Horner in a lot of those meetings, just like how, and the way he even tells the story where uh, we have uh, Philip Baker Ball's character and they're like getting along their shot normally. But then as soon as video is brought up, he cuts to profile like side views of the characters, which is normally meant to imply that there's a type of confrontation and conflict between the characters. And that's because this is something Jack feels so passionately about. Even though it might not be something the rest of us take seriously, these types of films, it clearly is something C takes seriously. And C holds himself to very high standards with his work in terms of the art form of it. And I think it's it's really interesting to see how PTA adapts the, the changing times, not only through his filmmaking style, the fun, energetic, fast-moving 70s to the more, uh, the more pessimistic mood of the 80s section, but just the way he tells this story on the changing in the industry that he feels so passionate about through uh, a story about the porn industry in the 70s. So, Ryan, I don't know if you had any thoughts on just the 70s versus the 80s. Yeah, like you were saying, like all the effects that the characters have to deal with, um, like Jack at the end, it, it really just runs out the film so well. And there is such a like distinct split in the middle of the movie like, between the 70s and the 80s. Um, like we start like the film towards the end of the 70s everybody's at the peak of their powers enjoying their lavish lifestyle from their choices that they've made um and this really culminates in the giant iconic like dance sequence in the club um and of course it's a very common storytel- storytelling technique where we see all the characters enjoying themselves and we know there's a big downhill eventually coming um again calling back to films that have clearly inspired them like goodfellas 
Um, but this, yeah, but this is when we see a big switch in the second half. It all centers around that New Year's Eve party. Is it all as a splitting point in the story? All our characters, um, we start to see the shortcomings that they'll see later on in the movie, like Dark's introduced to drugs. Um, Jack Horner, again, like you said, is his backers are talking to him, trying to get him to switch. Um, how he's making his movies from film to digital. Um, however, the main thing that happens at this party is, of course, when Bill finally cracks at the the ongoing joke of his wife cheating on him. Um, and it's probably it's definitely the best built up joke throughout the film, but it, it suddenly becomes very real when he shoots his wife and then shoots himself in front of the rest of the party. And this is the the first real cut to black that we've seen in the film, um, really emphasise and that that split in the movie. And like, there's a quote from PTA that really sums up the the film in general. It's like it's all fun and games until um someone gets hurt, and that I think that just really sums up the movie as a whole. And um, and then after that party, we now are fully into the 80s and we see the real work repercussions of the actions of our like, main characters and the lifestyle that they've chosen. Um, like Amber fails to get custody of her son um, because of her background. Um, she's not seemed fit to, to look after him. Um, Buck goes to the bank to get a loan for his new business, but he's again rejected because of his past. Dark is continuously direct, addict, addicted to drugs and feeling insecure about being replaced with the new talent, which eventually leads to his downfall later on. And then Jack actually starts shooting in digital. Um, as you kind of see, he isn't shooting the, the art films that he thinks he was. Um, he, he's not really interested in them like before. Like, they were always kind of shit, like you could tell. But he thought they really worked out. Um, but now they're very sleazy. And they are more of like kind of adult films that you'd expect them to be making. Um, yeah, so again, like what all starts out as fun and games in the first half does turn completely on all of them. But yeah, um, Oscar... Do you have anything to add about that seventies eighties split? Yeah, I mentioned I mentioned it um, uh, briefly earlier about how I thought the seventies was kind of organized chaos, and this is kind of uncontrolled chaos. It's just kind of all hell is let loose, really, and characters kind of deteriorate off slowly and slowly. And uh, like I mentioned earlier, that kind of rise of the new star, obviously, um, the rise of the new star, kind of taking over and and the kind of the lack of acceptance uh from the previous stars obviously kind of influenced from sunset Bul- sunset boulevard billy wilder and that's obviously carried on to films like babylon now so it's the influence that all those films have had but i think um i think the incredible soundtrack as well also kind of really really carries that transition between the 70s and 80s and makes it so so clear to us uh what's happened and i think just the music just carries the scene so so well like i'm just I'm just sitting there dancing every five minutes in the film. It's unbelievable. Uh, but yeah, but there's uh, the the tonal shift in the kind of last third of this film is handled very, very well. And that's not usually the case for a lot of films because a big tonal shift uh, directors usually really struggle with. So, Will, you got anything to add? I think you guys summed that up perfectly. There is that big shift between the 70s and 80s. Um, but I kind of just want to talk about the soundtrack. Oscar was talking about it briefly. It's exceptional. Like every song, every needle drop that comes on is perfect. Um, it just, yeah, like you said, you're dancing between every scene. It, you're just so immersed. It makes you feel like you're there listening to the music with all these people. Um, and just the importance of sound. Like well, I'll hand it off to Alex to talk about that, that final scene with Alfred Molina. But the way he's able to control the soundscape and really create tension and chaos with um, external sound and the score... Um, it's pretty exceptional, and I think the score in Boogie Nights is up there with the greats, to be honest. Um, yeah, but Alex, uh, Ryan, did you guys want to move on to that amazing final scene? Uh, I think let's... I, I want to wait a little bit before we touch on the final scene, just because there's okay, just yeah. one about it, and uh, I think it deserves its own section of just focused attention, because we'll get to research that in a minute, but if I had to describe this film in one word, it would be intoxicating. It really is just an intoxicating experience with just like it's sex, drugs, rock and roll to the max. And what I think the soundtrack does better than anything else is just create a certain energy to it. There's always like this very fast moving, constantly simulating energy in a film. That's not necessarily the most fast paced movie. It's fast paced in terms of going from character to character, but these scenes play out for a very long time. It's not like a more of a modern film where there's something happening to move the story forward every two seconds. He lets you sit with a lot of character moments that a lot of other people would cut out of the film. And it really is just this rock and roll energy that keeps you excited and interested throughout the entire runtime. And then 
he just heightens that so perfectly with his steady cam shots, his just the spins that he does around the characters, really making you feel drunk and feeling the excitement of like this new world opening up to you the same way that it's opening up to dirt. And I think it really is in uh, potential to be the greatest soundtrack of all time, just with the variety from, you know, 70s disco songs, 70s rock and roll, 80s more hardcore rock and roll. Then like those smooth, slower jams like Magnet and Steel and, the, you know, when he's shown in the hot tub, just like the cool laid back mood he creates there. So even those calmer scenes, the music just captures the energy of everything perfectly. But I think what really makes it stand out soundtrack wise, just how much of it there is compared to other films. Obviously, we talk a lot about his Scorsese influence and kind of Goodfellas, but he, he plays almost every song in nearly its entire length. Like not only does he have a lot of songs, they play for insanely extended amounts of time, which is so rare. There's that there's so many songs that play for one to two minutes or more. And even having, you know, back like a lot of people have like the compression time music montages, but he'll he'll do that back to back with two different songs, like just extending the montage where it's not really to compress time, it's just to capture so many things and create so many different moods and feelings throughout the, as we see, you know, Dirk rising up and being accepted into the family and kind of getting all those things he wanted in that the one specific back-to-back -back montage. And yeah, it's just the soundtrack is, I, I, always, I always say the top three most important things in film, number one, music, number two, music, number three, music. And this is absolutely textbook in uh, defending that argument because very few people can select the music and use the rhythm of the instruments the way Paul Thomas Anderson can. But Ryan, I'm sure you have many thoughts yourself on this Dynamite soundtrack. Yeah, like you said, that definitely is one of the best soundtracks. Um, particularly that Jesse's Girl scene that we'll talk about later. But yeah, that actually wasn't, like you said, how he would just let songs play out completely. Um, I was listening to the director's commentary and he said that they didn't actually plan on letting Jesse's Girl play out completely. There's also that scene where he sits on um, Mark Wahlberg and it just happened to eventually hit the chorus of the song and it just worked out so perfectly. Um, so he let it keep going. Um, yeah, but like one of you said, like you said, um, one of the songs plays for like the, the pool party and it's another example of just one of the great like long takes that he has. Um, that is one of the best or my favorite scenes from the movie. Um, that kind of follows us girl into the pool. And if the camera goes into the pool with her and it comes out and there's still more dialogue in this long take, it's one of the craziest long takes I've ever seen. But yeah, I don't, I don't think I have anything to start with the, the songs to use. It's just a banger, bang, banger soundtrack, banger score. Um, You could listen to it on its own or you could just queue up all the songs he uses and listen to that as well. It's uh, phenomenal. Now I think it's a good time to get into the greatest scene in the history of cinema. This is, if I had to pick one scene that I consider the best scene in movie history, it's the drug deal scene with Alfred Molina. It's just the most perfectly executed scene I've ever seen. And what Paul Thomas Anderson, really, like, what, what I'm gonna, this scene, what it does better than anything else is showcase why movies need to be seen in theaters. It is the most heightened scene ever when you see this in a theater with the full surround sound speakers and everything is just so high volume. You can't, you can't take your eyes off the screen or even think about anything else because it truly just captivates you in a way where you can't avoid and what's, you can't avoid hearing anything in the environment, just like the characters in them. And I don't know if anyone has ever been in, you know, just a super uncomfortable environment, but the way Paul Thomas Anderson uses sound and performance to create it is some of the greatest filmmaking I've ever seen with the fireworks going off in addition to the loud rock and roll, which have no rhythms of them either, which makes it jarring because it's not like it's a rhythm of the fireworks where you gotta get conditioned to it. You never know when one's just gonna go off and startle you. And just the way he, it's, it's all about the atmosphere around the characters here. It's not just, uh, it's not just what's going on directly with them, but everything that's just happening around them, they're stuck in this crazy environment. And we're just waiting for that robbery to happen. And then all of a sudden it slows down with that long extended hole on Mark Wahlberg's face. And judging by Mark Wahlberg's past, he's probably been in a lot of situations like this and a lot of environments that are probably not the most comfortable. So I think he connected with the scene on a very personal level. 
John C. Riley's hilarious the way he jumps every single time the firework goes off. But, you know, just the, every single story beat of it. Like, the way first it's like the, we get a glimpse of the bodyguard, and then we know that he has a gun, and the way he lingers on that gate when he shuts. And then just even things like when he uh, Alfred Molina hits the bubbler when he's smoking. Just it's like an odd angle. It just It's just rising the tension with the sound. It's just making you feel less comfortable. He hands them the box. We're like, oh, shit, what's in the box? And then he opens it up, and it's a gun, so we think they're in trouble. And then he's even more nuts. He puts it to his head. And it's just, it's constantly subverting your expectations. And there's not a single moment that you can sit back and relax for this entire extended scene, which is pretty much the entire third act of the film. Like most, the scene has, a, the film has a lot of scenes within it, but pretty much the whole third act is just this one scene and then the wrap up montage after. It's, uh, I've been even before just at the hotel with like the sound changes on the three cut ins and just rotating like three times around the table as they plan it. It's, uh, honestly, I can just break it down in every little detail because there's that much detail to creating literally the most uncomfortable atmosphere in cinema. So if you ever get the chance to see Boogie Nights in a theater, this scene just hits different when you feel like you're in this atmosphere and you, like the characters in it, can't escape it. So, Ryan, what are your thoughts on the drug deal scene? Because I know we're all very big fans of it. Mm, yeah, it's, it's such a good scene in the movie. It's definitely the most intense um, so far. And, you know, we're, before we go in, even go into the the house, we're made aware of this scheme that they're going to try and scam out for Melina, which already sets up the tension that we're going to have. Um, but that, the scene is so different to the rest of the film. Like, we have a lot of long takes, not a lot of hard cuts that you notice. Um, but there's a very big change of pacing of the cuts for the scene and making quick cuts to emphasize, like, the anxiety of the characters. And the loud noises, of course, we have the guy throwing the firecrackers, which just scares you, like, intimidately. Like, you just never know what he's going to throw it. Um, Alfred Murillina, just so unhinged, singing Jesse's Girl. Um, like, the kind of juxtaposition of, like, the pop song and has just crazy performance along with that. It's just building so much tension between, the, like, all the three characters that we've followed in. Uh, it's just a phenomenal scene. Um, yeah, just blend, blending in all these long, uncomfortable shots that we have. As they, like Alex said, as they walk in, they kind of, kind of sits on the security door just creating that like claustrophobia as we walk into his house into the sort of like drug den that's full of smoke which i mean just sets up just the whole atmosphere that's really good from the start um i'll focus on all the characters faces as they're sitting on the couch um and there's that of course that long take that we talked about on dark where you just see him start to question like everything he's like he's done for the film and um, i mean that's kind of where he comes to the realization that he's truly just hit rock bottom in his life and the needs to go back to to amber but yeah the scenes the scene feels very 90s it, it feels like a tarantino scene kind of i thought um it's just something about the atmosphere and the the crazy characters and the the use of um pop music that just feels like his kind of style but it's definitely one of my favorite moments in the film well what did you think about it yeah i think it's funny that you say it, it reminds you of tarantino because i totally think harvey keitel and reservoir dogs throughout the entire thing like kind of that organized chaos but it's just kind of actual chaos um yeah the way he's able to just build tension is great and i was reading in an article that alfred molina actually wore earplugs so that he couldn't really hear the firecrackers or the loud noises so it seemed even more schizophrenic when he wasn't flinching with like these firecrackers and fireworks going off um so i think just like the little details like alex said just everything about it the precision was shots it's um, a lot of show don't tell, which is really impressive. Like there doesn't need to be a lot said, but a lot is already conveyed. And we get that right when they walk in, like the, like Ryan said, the aesthetic or uh, like everything kind of sinks in at that very moment. Like the, the descent to rock bottom is over because you have reached rock bottom. And I think again, like the performance from Alfred Molina, we've already rhymed off what 12 actor actresses that deserve awards. There's 13 Alfred Molina. He could be a steal of the show. He was fantastic in that limited role as an insane person. Um, but yeah, one of my favorite scenes of all time, quite frankly, and just one of the most tense and riveting um, moments in a film for me. And I got to see it in a theater because I, I've yet to see it in a theater. I've only seen it twice. It's all once on a, on a TV, once on my computer, big screens up next because I feel like that that intensity would definitely be heightened uh, especially in that moment. 
like Alex, but uh, Oscar to see a film twice and once in theaters to properly see the film. Mm. But, yeah. Exactly, but I kind of I agree to a certain extent. Like I feel like you got to see a film twice to like fully, I don't know, get a good understanding. And then in theaters is just the best way to see it. Biggest picture, loudest noise. I totally agree. I'm on Alex's team here. Um, but yeah, I don't know what Oscar. If... Sorry, what was that, Alex? For sound, even more than picture with this one. Yes, that you're on. You're sound. on a great. Is really like even if you were seeing on a smaller screen, that immersive sound landscape for this scene specifically is just going to make you feel something you could never feel at watching it on a computer or at on your home TV. Totally, yeah. Music is just so immersive; it drives so much emotion, and I feel like without that, it's a little bit lost. Um, but yeah, Oscar, did you have any final thoughts? Um, yeah, kind of adding on to what other people have been saying, those. Uh, I didn't, I'd kind of forgotten, I'd remembered parts of this scene, but the, the firecrackers in particular, is, I think it's just brilliant. Oh, oh, maybe after a couple of years, you think he's going to stop, and it just keeps going, and it keeps going, and it keeps going, and it just it just winds you up and just causes so much frustration. But that's exactly what's intended it to do. And I think um, even that other guy, like the kind of the bodyguard, the guy in the background, after he's been handed the fake drugs, the camera's just, is he's always there in the background. He's always noticeable. And he kind of feels like he's taking too long to check. And you you know it's fake. And the fact that he's always in the background there seen, and it, after every shot, he's always there. And you're kind of waiting for the moment when he realizes that they're fake. And it doesn't really happen. And obviously what, what does happen in the end is everything um, goes tits up. But I think that's just really, really brilliant just to add that kind of character in the background. The attention detail is absolutely brilliant. There's just everything. There's always one detail in every shot that's just building to the tension throughout the scene and it just uh, boils up absolutely brilliantly and it's just so entertaining to watch. Yeah, I'd, I'd just like to add, like, you know, you were saying, like, um, I didn't actually find out about the, the coke. There was a del deleted scene, actually, where Alfred Mueller goes back into the house and he goes to take a snap of it and finds out that it's just flour and he, he loses it and then the police show up outside his window and there's just a complete shout between him and the cops because he goes back and just gets his machine gun but yeah i don't know if that's available to watch if i just heard it on the call. Alter alternate ending what what is that i've never even <laughs> heard of that before <laughs> that's wicked yeah but a fantastic final scene and uh, a fantastic film um, but yeah, I got Boogie Nights at a four to four and a half out of five. Um, it's high in my PTA ranking. Um, but I think we're going to go through our PTA films. Going to rank them really quick. See if Boogie Nights holds up against the rest. Is it his best? Is it his worst? We're going to find out. Um, I think we're just going to do a rapid fire. Ten through one. Give me a little sentence or two of why this film is so great. Let's hear it. Okay. In last place, I've got Hard Eight. Probably says a lot. Last place in a lot of people's um, a lot of signs of his brilliance, but kind of a lackluster second half really brings it down for me. Of course, there was a lot of things, and um, with the casino was fun. It's a great cast. It's just one of those, and he's from Oak Fit doesn't hold up to his usual standards for me. And it, of course, he was twenty five, and they had, didn't have full control over it, so you can't blame him. Um, number nine or number eight, in inherent vice. It's a weird one. Probably PTA's most polarizing film. Um, it's a film that requires a second watch, so I can't really judge it fully yet. But it's a bit hard. To, it's a one that's hard to follow at times, and another great performance by Wacking, But I'll need to return to re return to it later on. Um, number seven, Punch Drunk Love. Um, it's been a while since I've seen this. It's a very good movie, maybe a bit overrated by most people. Uh, it's nothing that blew me away. Um, it, I wasn't really aware of PTA when I watched it. It was just a film that everybody talks about is Adam Sandler's best performance. So that's why I watched it. But yeah. Um. It's definitely up there in his performances, but I, I still think it, it holds up as, as well as PTA's other films. Um, number six, The Master, another film that I feel is I'm missing something in it. It's, I don't hold it quite as highly as other people. Um, it's definitely one of PTA's best looking movies. It's beautifully shot in film. Um, the perform performances really shine here. Um, probably Philip Seymour Hoffman's be best under PTA and one of the best from Joaquin Phoenix as well, but the screenplay is just kind of missing something that doesn't elevate it to being really like, truly great for me um number five we've got now a t we're now at a kind of tier of films from pt that i think are really great films um daniel de lewis re returning to deliver another all-timer performance i think under pt um it's a great character study over or going over a kind of interesting relationship to say the least but one that i've 
only seen one, so it's a bit lower down, down in my ranking. Number four, Licorice Pizza. Very much kind of PTA's once upon a time in Hollywood. Um, so at a time where he was growing up and it's obviously a passion project for him. All the characters are fun to be around with, I think. Um, it's kind of bittersweet seeing Cooper Hoffman continuing that kind of film relationship between his dad and PTA that they shared. The age gap's a bit weird and there's a, there's a few unnecessary jokes in the film, but apart from that, it's a really strong entry in his filmography. Number three, Magnolia. Um, we're kind of nine on, on to my 4.5s, I think, for um, his ranking. Um, Magnolia is definitely one of the best of the 90s, I think. Uh, I really like how it's told with all the separate stories that's like connected. Tom Cruise really steals the show with one of the, the most unhinged performances I've ever seen. 1999 really was like just an unreal year for him. Um, probably remembered for its weird ending, um, but it definitely sits at the top of, or towards the top of my PTA ranking. But again, I'll need to see it again because it's one that I've only seen once. <clears throat> um, and second, I've got one of the best looking films ever made. One of the best of the 2000s, There Will Be Blood. Such an incredible um, all-timer performance from... What's his name? I forget his name. Daniel Day Lewis. Daniel Day Lewis, yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, and such an outstanding supporting cast as well. Uh, this is nearly my number one, but I just don't quite enjoy it as much as, well, my number one, I won't spoil it, but you know what? Um, again, a great use of long takes from PTA, the scene where the oil explodes and sets on fire is just so iconic and it's a hard decision, but it's my number two my filmography rank in a PTA. And then, of course, number one, Big Night. It's just such a great film. We've talked about it already to no end, but who wants to go next? You ready, Alex? Yeah, I can go next. He was like reconsidering his life before I, I threw him on the spot there. He's like, wait, I'm not ready to do this. I just, I just have to pull up the letterbox, but it's like so deep. I finished his filmography a while ago, so. Yeah, it's pretty short. He, we forgot to mention that he's only made nine feature films, right? So I think yep. have we all completed his filmography. That's I've I've already mm-hmm. did. So yeah, we've all completed his filmography. So this will give you a pretty good just of what his, uh, what his filmography looks like. All right, Alex, take it away. Starting at nine. Starting us off at nine would be Inherent Vice. I was super excited to watch this one for the first time because I love film noir. I love detective novels. Raymond Chandler's had a huge influence on me, and I like stoner movies as well. So I was really interested to see one of my favorite directors combine the two, but unfortunately the result well, didn't quite live up to my personal expectations. You know, it's, it's not a bad film. To have this as your lowest-ranked film is still very impressive. There's a lot to like here, but... It just didn't reach the heights of those other PTA films for me and didn't really leave me with much that kind of stayed with me after I watched it. Number eight, we have Punch Drunk Love. Another one, super excited to see it because I love Adam Sandler and him and PTA, I was so excited to see, but it was just kind of underwhelming. Didn't necessarily leave a huge impact on me. Again, there's a lot to like about this film, a lot of brilliant directing in it, but just don't think it's quite on the level of Paul Thomas Anderson's other work. Number seven, we have The Master, and I know this is a very popular pick to be high up on a lot of lists, but I think it's a big, this is one that I watched it very late at night, I was very tired, so I don't feel like I got a true, genuine experience with this film because I was so tired when I watched it, I was fighting sleep as much as I was enjoying the film, but I think... You know, it's interesting, too, because I hold PTA so highly as a director in terms of influence on me and my personal rankings, but I've only seen two of his movies in theaters. So I think that's interesting that even I've, that I've seen so many of them only at home, I still consider him such a great director. So that's a compliment to him. I'm sure I like The Master a lot more had I seen it in the theaters. And yeah, it's just some incredibly powerful close-ups in those films with great performances and just those extended, very tight, like almost Ingmar Bergman-like close-ups was incredibly executed by PTA and the lead actors Phil Seymour Hoffman and Joaquin Phoenix. Number six, we have Phantom Thread, a film that I didn't expect to like as much as I did. This one was one that I, I, of Paul Thomas Anderson, I was interested, but I didn't quite have the same excitement for it that I did some of his other projects. And he really kind of exceeded my expectations with this one. Just the way he evolved from those real long, like, steady cam, immersive ensemble pieces we saw in Boogie Nights into this, these real strong static compositions with a more personal one-on-one character relationship rather than a big ensemble was a very interesting way that we've seen him develop as an artist. And it was a new kind of, 
it was very new territory for Paul Thomas Anderson. There's real quiet atmospheres, like the scene where I think she's buttering toast or something to do with bread. And just the, the small sounds and how important those are is such a contrast from the real loud, captivating, high-volume atmospheres of Boogie Nights. So it's just an incredible development as an artist, how far he's come along. Number five, we have Hard Eight. I, I personally love Hard Eight. It was the first, Paul Thomas Anderson's director I watched mostly in order. I most For the most part, I watched his films in the order, the release order. And I love casinos. I like films about gambling. And I love the characters, the atmosphere, the environments of this film. And it's a very contained piece, but I think the characters are very multidimensional and just interesting characters so uh, I think it's just a very interesting piece like I said I like it's also a nighttime piece set in a casino so I'm gonna have some level of bias towards it there just because I typically like those types of films but incredible first uh debut film from one of the best directors ever number four I have Magnolia a film I would really love to get the chance to see in theaters this is kind of his his epic film it's it's the only one he's done that succeeded a three-hour runtime and it definitely earns it with taking that big ensemble style of PTA to an absolute next level with characters who he doesn't focus on just one narrative throughout the whole runtime it's kind of a lot of little smaller narratives that really get in deep with the characters which I love one of the best performances from Tom Cruise, who doesn't always get his credit as an actual dramatic actor compared to his movie star persona, but gives a dynamite performance. Magnolia is a film of so many layers, so I just, I've only seen it once. There's so much more to unpack on rewatches that, you know, I can't wait to see it again. Number three, Licorice Pizza. And now we're getting into my five stars. Licorice Pizza was my favorite film of 2021, which had some good competition as well. But I saw this film six times in theaters. It has like a very home movie-esque quality to it, which I like. One of the best soundtracks ever. Great character work. And once again, we just see PTA bringing fresh storytelling to every single scene. Where we see him combine his early style of the more ensemble pieces and the memorable side characters and the, the frequent steady cam moving camera with some of those stronger static compositions. And we really see... He kind of developed as an artist so much to Phantom Thread, but here we see him kind of merge the styles. and It's almost like he kind of went back home and showcased what he's learned since he kind of was making films in San Fernando Valley. It's just such a fun kind of experience of a film, and it's more of like an atmosphere character piece rather than plot, which those are the type of films I, that normally stick with me the most. I love Licorice Pizza. It's like one of those films I could turn on any day of the week and enjoy it. Number two, I have a film a lot of people argue as one of the greatest films ever made and could definitely, definitely belongs in that conversation. That's There Will Be Blood. Daniel Day-Lewis gives the best perform, arguably one of, one of the best performances in the history of film. It, she's so captivated into this character. You never feel like he's acting for a single second. And just the way in this kind of lone character piece where this is really that pivot in Paul Thomas Anderson's career where he got focused on just one lone character for the whole film. And he does it with a great character study, which comments on, you know, things about America and the American system and capitalism in such an artistic way without, you know, necessarily going on a big monologue on it or commenting on it through dialogue, but just through the character's actions and the objective and the way he, the, the lengths he'll take to get to those objectives, just tell that this very deep story in a very simple way at the same time. So I think it's just a brilliant commentary on so many things and... Really, PTA showing his greatest height of what he can be as an artist, probably, with this one. Number one, it's one of my favorite films of all time. It's a top ten favorite of mine of any film ever. It's, like, gone to my head, like, give ten films to watch the rest of your life. Like, one of them, like, it's had so much influence on me. It's a film that I went to see it in the movie theater and then went home and wrote a script right away because I felt that inspired by and... You know, those types of truly inspiring films are rare, and this is definitely one of those films for me. The way it uses music is something I wish more films would embrace, because I just love that style of, like, rock and roll, high-volume energy. And, you know, we just spent a lot of time talking about it, but it's just one of the greatest films ever. Obviously, I'm talking about Boogie Nights. Ensemble characters, high-energy rock and roll music, just a burst of cinematic creative storytelling in every scene. That's everything I could possibly want in the film. And that's why I think it's one of the best films ever and my number one Paul Thomas Anderson film. Good list.
So both of you guys have Boogie Nights at one. Will Oscar disappoint? <laughs> um, he will. So, um, to Alex's disappointment, number nine for me is his most recent film, Licorice Pizza. The it's not a bad film. There's kind of a big step up between nine and eight for me, but I just felt there's a like uh, Ryan mentioned. There's a lot of unnecessary jokes in this, in my opinion. I don't think the story is the most cohesive thing, and uh, their age gap is a bit questionable. I I kind of have that problem with some other films as well. It kind of puts me off the the film as a whole slightly, but nonetheless, great soundtrack, great cinematography, great performances. It's it's a decent film. I have it a three star. Number eight for me, and a massive jump up up to my four stars now. I have it Inherent Vice, Joaquin Phoenix, obviously absolutely brilliant. It does get messy at times for sure, but it's it's a detective film. Uh, I'm always going to be kind of mostly engaged with a part of it, and it's PTA. I really like the style of this one. Uh, uh, as other people have said, some people kind of really hit or miss on this. This is usually the people his lowest film, but I enjoyed it quite a lot. Then uh, number seven is first film I have Hard Eight. Uh, casino films I absolutely love uh, like Alex has mentioned I really like the story of this is kind of just gets right into it right away with what the story is about and I do think some of the time jumps in this don't work as well as they should do um, but, uh, it kind of loses its effect as the story goes on but I, I really really enjoyed it another four star for me number six I've got Phantom Thread one that I do definitely want to rewatch though because I feel like it may go up for me on second watch because a lot of these I've only seen for the first time. Um, but it's a really, really good character study, like um, others have mentioned. Um, I really like the performances in this. It's very, it's a very different tone to a lot of his films. It's a lot more toned down I, um, than some of his other ones. But one that I'm definitely wanting to rewatch soon. But pretty good film. Then uh, into top five and into my four and a half. So I have The Master starring two of my probably one of my favorite ensembles of all time with three of my eight favorite actors of all time Joaquin Phoenix, Felicity Moore Hoffman and Amy Adams all give absolutely all time performances in my opinion arguably three of their best performances I think the story is really really interesting um, I know a lot of people aren't that engaged with it but I find it just fascinating absolutely beautiful film from start to finish um, yeah not sure what else to add uh, from what other people have said but I like it a lot more than other people seem to, apparently. Then at number four, on a film that I clearly love more than Alex and Ryan so far, I've got Punch Drunk Love, um, which I did watch for the first time about a month or so back. But this just connected with me so well. The 90-minute runtime is absolutely perfect, and the characters, I think, have fleshed out so well in that short runtime. It is such an enjoyable time. Um, Adam Sandler, absolutely brilliant. Emily Watson, also incredible. The use of colour in this film is just so, so perfect. And it's just so beautiful to look at. I I underestimated, underestimated how many other people don't necessarily love this film. But I absolutely do. Works for me so well. Into my top three now. And I have all of these at a five star. In third place, I have There Will Be Blood. Daniel Day-Lewis, for me, Alex has echoed it, is probably the greatest acting performance I've ever seen. People kind of diss method, method actors, but really Daniel Day-Lewis is the only one that's ever actually worked and proven that um, to the capabilities that he has. And it's, it's so incredible to see here. The dialogue is absolutely perfect. There's so many iconic shots in this from the the scene where the or tower's burning down and he's just on his knees in front of it. The ending just completely takes you by left field and it just comes out of nowhere. But I think it's really, really brilliant. It's got some really good things to say and kind of religion and kind of loss. Obviously, there's um, really, really good scenes with him and his son and kind of the obsession of money. Um, and I think that's a really key, key theme with kind of loads of PTA films is uh, obsession of the art. Right. The, I This top two I've been thinking about a lot recently it is it is definitely since uh i rewatched both of these films recently and to some surprise in second place is magnolia now um i'm not gonna uh, right um 
So I think I watched this film. I watched New Year's Eve last year. Absolutely incredible film. Probably the most moving film I watched all year. The the structure is absolutely brilliant. The way the characters interwoven are absolutely amazing. It's a three hour runtime that just absolutely flies by. Tom Cruise, like people have been saying, I 1999 Tom Cruise between Death and Eyes Wide Shut, probably one of my favorite years for an actor. His best year by far. His performance in this is absolutely brilliant. Is uh, along with Julianne Moore as well. They just feel so real and so raw. The the plethora of characters between kind of we've seen the ensembles between this and Boogie Eyes just absolutely brilliant. Um, the ending, uh, one of the most confusing and out of nowhere endings that a lot of people um, see when they watch this. I it can, takes people by complete surprise, but I absolutely love it. Um, you kind of you kind of know what you're in for kind of with that opening monologue and the opening speech and the sequences about chants and things like that. And I think that's kind of laid out perfectly throughout the film. But in at number one, as we have been discussing today, too many people's surprise is Boogie Nights now. And I don't know really what else to add from what we've already talked about today. It's just, I think what's uh, edged that above Magnolia for me, I love rewatching Magnolia and it moves me so well, but the entertainment I get out of rewatching Boogie Nights is just, it's unmatched for me. I just, I'm dancing every five minutes. I'm laughing every minute. The the characters are such joy to watch. It's a film that I was a bit skeptical of watching the first, not going to lie. The subject is definitely interesting, but once I watched it first, and I'm so glad I rewatched it now because it's an all-time favorite of mine now and I just absolutely love it a bit. Well, uh, I don't know if you're going to make us fall for, fall for Boogie Nights number one, but uh, we'll see. I don't know. We're, we're going to, I'll make you wait, I guess. Um, <laughs> starting at number nine, I've got Inherent Vice. I give it a three out of five. I think you guys kind of summed it up pretty well. It's not too memorable, but it's a detective noir, so it's already going to have a baseline interest for me. Again, not super memorable, but solid enough. At eight, I've got The Master. Again, I didn't really click with this as much as some people did. I think the acting performances are really great, but the screenplay feels a little anemic, um, underwritten. The characters aren't super... Um, I don't resonate a lot with the characters, so the master a bit low on my list, but I know a lot of people really like that. Uh, number seven, I got Heart Eight. Again, same type of thing. Themes are really good. Aesthetic setting's good. Gambling movie, good cast. But just something leaves a little bit, little bit to be desired. Not PTA's best, but still pretty good. Uh, number six, I've got Licorice Pizza. Um, again, a little unrememberable, but still a really solid film, I'd have to say. Um, a, P- a pretty personal film for PTA, I'd say. And a pretty good one, nonetheless. And now we got like my top five. I think there's a little bit of a discernible gap between the top five. Um... I got Phantom Thread. Daniel Day-Lewis puts in an absolute fantastic performance. I was a little skeptical to watch this. It was the last PTA I ended up watching, but I'm really glad I came around on it because I I thoroughly enjoyed it. It's definitely a bit slow, um, but still a really good film. Uh, Four, I've got Magnolia at four and a half. Oscar kind of nailed it. Magnolia is a fantastic film. Really good uh, Tom Cruise performance. Um... Can't say much more about that. And then the top three, Punch Drunk Love. I can't believe you guys were slandering it this much. Oscar had it at four. I got it at three. I thought it was really heartfelt. Easily Adam Sandler's best performance. All it needs is 90 minutes to generate so much emotion and so much attachment to such real and visceral characters. Um, Yeah, Punch Drunk Love is really slept on, apparently. Um, And then at number two, I've got Boogie Nights. Yes, and then there will be there will be blood at one. I just think there will be blood is a more complete film. It is one of my favorite films of all time. Daniel Day Lewis puts in one of my favorite favorite performances of all time as well. I think there's just so much to unpack. There's so much, so many themes, such great dialogue, great like there. It's just firing on every cylinders. Paul Dano turns in an absolutely fantastic performance, and just like the character of Daniel Plainview is just so well written. Like the, the time you spend with him is just ridiculous you basically see him go from rock bottom all the way to the top all the way to the bottom again it is pretty surreal an amazing film and yeah boogie nights at two so those are those two are pretty interchangeable i'd say there will be blood and boogie nights but um boogie nights at two there will be blood 
at one. That's my PTA ranking. Good list. At least you didn't have inherent vice above licorice pizza. Like, what is that, Oscar? <laughs> yeah, dude, inherent vice just is not it. I'm, uh, oh, man. <laughs> I don't know. But um, I, I guess I can, buy that. I can now say Boogie Nights is featured on one of our collections, the Shot by Shot collection. Um, if you want to see a full episode breaking down the collection and the other films like Boogie Nights who are, that are so great on the collection, comment below. We'll do a full episode on the Shot by Shot podcast collection um, and Boogie Nights, the first title we're covering today. We've said all there is to be said about the fantastic writer-director that is Paul Thomas Anderson and his second film, Boogie Nights. So if you haven't seen it, go check it out. I recommend uh, formulating your own opinions and com commenting below. Uh, give us your PTA rankings and, of course, hit us letterbox, Twitter, all down low, all in the description. I respond to everything. We respond to everything. So thanks for tuning in. See ya.